Okay, folks, let's get started. I, I don't need to remind you because I know you know what's coming, but uh, your project is due day after tomorrow by 5 o'clock. I've actually got two group summaries in, so that's good. We're getting started. So here's what's going to happen. As I say, you know, that summary sheet, when you get a chance, please do fill it out and send it in to me. Even if one person in the group is just hanging out, just do the rest of the group and send it in because I need to get those by tomorrow evening because I've pulled them together. I'll create a master summary sheet. And then I'll do a little sorting based on undervaluation. Over. I'll tell you what percentage of your companies came out undervalued, what percentage came out overvalued, what the 10 most undervalued, what the 10 most overvalued. Everything that comes out of your analysis will be fed back to you. But to be fed back to you, I've got to get the raw data. Please don't go add columns to the spreadsheet. I know you're doing it to be helpful but it makes my life incredibly difficult because I've got to cut and paste, and if you've added a column, then I'm cutting and pasting in the wrong place. Okay? Don't add notes in there. You know, if, you, if you want to add notes, put it in the email that comes with the sum summary. And uh, so basically, it's just six numbers for your company. So when you have the numbers ready, you don't have to get the project report done before you turn in the summary. All you need is the final numbers to be in there with your recommendation. Okay? So that's for the project. Uh, for the final exam, it's Friday, 10 to 12. It'll be here. Okay. So it'll be comprehensive. It'll include everything. In so I'll, I'll, I'll mention towards the end of Wednesday's session what the setup for the final is. But you can ki I've kind of given away the game. I've said the bulk of the final is going to be what we've done since the third quiz, which is really not that much of a giveaway. Because w if you t take a look at what we've done since the third quiz, it builds on what we've done in the first three. So it's not like you can say, well, I can ignore everything that happened before the third quiz. It all builds on itself. So today I want to finish the last piece of this class, which is we, we, we got started on this in the last session, talking about increasing the value of a business. Okay? So here's what I'd like you to think about. Pick any bad company. right? Any company that comes to mind is a bad company. Company in trouble. It doesn't have to be a bad company, because bad suggests that managers are terrible people. Companies become bad companies for all kinds of reasons. So it could be research in motion. It could be Hewlett Packard. It could be Avon products. I mean, you could take the list. I think last a few months ago, there was a list of the 10 worst managed companies in the US. You can take that list and go down that list. Pick any company. What we're trying to come up with are the tools to turn that company around, if possible. And sometimes you might decide that there is no way to turn the company around, that the best thing for this company to do is shrink and go away. And I'm going to say something that I said at the very beginning of my corporate finance class and all the way through this class. There's no glory in keeping a company going just for the sake of keeping it going. A company is a legal entity. It doesn't have to preserve and protect itself. If, there's, if its original purpose is gone, it's best to let the company go. The businesses might not die. So hostess as a company might be gone, but the Twinkie, if in fact there is demand for it, will be go to somebody else. Somebody else will produce that product. So we talked about the first way to increase value is to kind of focus on existing cash flows and pump them up. So today I'd like to start off with a, with a few pre-class tests of whether we get this notion of value enhancement. Here's the first one. I made a big deal about the difference between value enhancement and price enhancement at the start of this session, you know, at the start of this, this part of the, 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 the notes. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to read you a bunch of actions. And I'd like you to tell me whether this action is going to be a value-changing action, value increasing or value decreasing. First, a stock split. What happens in a stock split? I don't change the cash flows. I don't change the discount rate. I don't change the business. What do I change? I just change the number of units in the company, right? A stock split is a perfect example of a completely cosmetic action. I can do a 10 for one, 100 for one, just the number of units changes. Now part of you is saying, but the stock price might change. Hold off on that. It could be price changing, and we might talk about why this, the, that can happen, but it doesn't change value. A couple of weeks ago, HP impaired $8.8 .8 billion in goodwill, right? That's a big expense. You're going to report a huge loss. Does impairing goodwill affect value? Under what conditions would impairing goodwill actually affect value? What has to be true about the goodwill impairment? What does it have to get you? It has to affect your cash flows, right? 
When do expenses affect your cash flows? If you get a tax savings from those expenses. If the impairment of goodwill were tax deductible, this would actually be, if, if in fact the market knows you've screwed up, now you get the tax benefit from it. You'd expect your cash flows to change. But because it's not a tax deductible expense, it's a completely empty gesture. It's not affecting your future cash flows. It's not affecting your discount rate. Again, you might say, but the stock price went down on the day of the impairment. Hold off on that. Let's talk about why prices might change. But value itself hasn't changed. Changing depreciation methods. US companies sometimes change depreciation methods. And many of them will change it only in their reporting books. You're saying, is that legal to have two sets of books? In the US, it's actually legal to have two sets of books, one for the tax guy and one for you and I. So what you see in the annual report, the 10K, the financial statements, is actually the reporting books. So what, as a company, think about what your prior priorities are. For the tax guy, you want to report as little in income as you can, so you pay as little in taxes as you can, right? When you get to your stockholders, though, because of this focus on earnings per share and net income looking good, you want to report earnings which are much higher. Generically, there are two ways you can depreciate an asset. You can do straight line depreciation, where you can take the life of the asset and write off an equal amount each year, or accelerated depreciation, where you get more upfront and less later. You get the total amount of depreciation is the same. You've just bought a very expensive asset. When you do your tax books, which depreciation method do you want to choose? You want to use accelerated depreciation because it lowers your income, lowers your taxes. But then you get to the reporting books and you say, that'll make me look bad. My earnings per share will look much lower. So you switch to straight line depreciation. But again, it's a purely cosmetic effect. Your cash flows are driven not by what you show me in your reporting books, but by what, what you show me in your tax books. It again has no effect on cash flows and discount rate. It has no effect on value, but your earnings per share might actually look much better because you made that change. I don't know whether you're familiar with tracking stock. In the late 90s, when the dot-com boom was at its peak, companies started issuing tracking stock on subsets of businesses. So for instance, New York Times could take New York Times online, or dot-com, or whatever they called it, and issue tracking stock. You say, what, what, what do I get with the tracking stock? You really get nothing. You know what you get? You get a share of the profits from that division. But you have no corporate governance rights. You have no board of directors. That division continues to be run by the New York Times. So they can allocate any expense they want to that division. You're completely unprotected. But why were they doing it? Because dot-com stock was zooming, so they said, we want to take advantage of it. So let's move this forward 12 years. Now social media is hot, so New York Times decides to start a social media business. New York Times social media. They issued tracking stock against it. They're still doing the same thing they did yesterday. The business is exactly the business. But you might pay a huge premium for social media companies because you think they're worth a lot. Again, you can have an impact on price, but not on value. I'll make a statement. This might seem you know, over the top. But I think 80 to 85% of what companies do has absolutely no impact on value. They waste time and resources meddling with things that have no impact on value. They do it because it makes them look better. They do it because they want to affect prices. And a lot of accounting things that get done, accounting adjustments, are really designed to kind of pump up the price. They have no effect on value. So what I'm trying to say is a lot of things that you see out there as restructuring don't really pass muster as value enhancing. They're really designed to increase the price of the company. And if it is, in fact, purely cosmetic, guess what? What the market gives you, I guarantee it will take away. So now let's move on and let's look at some value changing actions. Let's suppose I've now hired you as a CEO of a multi-business company. It has four divisions. And I give you the numbers for the four divisions right now. Right? So the Division A, 20% return on capital, 10% cost of capital. Division B, 15% return on capital, 9% cost of capital. Division C, return on capital is equal to the cost of capital. Division D, return on capital, 3% cost of capital is 7.5%. You're now the new CEO. You're thinking of selling one of these businesses. This might sound like a no-brainer, but humor me anyway. Which business do you think you should sell? It just seems like a no-brainer. So what are you asking me? Of course, we've taken the corporate finance class. We should sell the bad business. Is that true, though? 
So when you sell the business, somebody's going to buy the business, right? Hopefully. And what will they pay you? You think you're going to get your capital back that you invest in this business? They're not dumb. They say this is a bad business. They're going to offer you the value of a bad business. You know what should drive divestitures? Not what business is good or bad, but what you're going to get in return for selling this business. You want to sell businesses where the divestiture value you get is greater than what I call the continuing value. The continuing value is what this business is worth to you as a continuing business. The divestiture value is what somebody will pay you. And here's the, it's one of the great ironies of coming into a multi-business company. Your worst businesses are probably not the best divestitures. You know which divisions people will tend to overpay for? Not your terrible divisions that have been doing badly. You want to take your very best division and hope that somebody will overpay. Because that's how you make money, by getting people to pay more than what something is worth to you. It's one thing that always troubles me in restructuring. It's always the bad businesses that people want to shed. And often, the point of view they take is, it's a bad business I will sell at any price. The minute you say that, say that, you know what's going to happen, right? Remember we saw that graph of where acquirers make the most money? Where do they make the most money? It's not from public companies. It's not from even private businesses. It's by buying divisions of other public companies. And I'll wager 90% of those divisions were badly performing divisions. And I'll go an extra step. If you walk up to HP today and offer them a half a billion, they will sell you autonomy. I'm just guessing. You know why? They're so, they're, they're so desperate to take that mistake off the books that if somebody said, I'll pay you $10, just give it to me. They say, OK, take it away, even though it might be worth $2 billion. So when you think about divestitures, think about what you're getting in return for what you're giving up. And it's like any other capital budgeting project. You want to make sure that what you receive exceeds what you're giving up in terms of cash flows in that business. We all looked at capital structure and corporate finance. So let's assume you're now the CEO of a company that's 200 million in debt and 800 million in equity. You work through the standard cost to capital analysis. The optimal debt ratio is 20%. What's its actual debt ratio? It's also 20%. You say, nothing we can do here. Cost to capital can't change. You're at your optimal. But is that true? Is there, some, is there anything else in financing you can do? to change your cost of capital that goes past or goes beyond just changing the mix of debt and equity? Are there any, th any other things that could lower your cost of capital? What else are you going to check? In addition to my debt ratio, what else would you like to check to see if, in fact, I could do something different? Would you, be, would, you be, would you care whether my debt is short-term or long-term, dollar debt or euro debt, fixed rate or floating rate? No? You don't care? No, they remember in corporate finance. What's the, what, what's the financing principle? Remember, we, we talked all through the corporate. It's uh, find the right mix of debt and equity. That's the right, first part of the principle. You remember what the second part was? Match the debt up to your assets. What, what, is, what did that mean? What, what were we talking about? Match the debt up to the assets. If you have long-term assets, you should be using long-term debt. If you have dollar assets, you should be using dollar debt. That matching the debt up to your assets reduces default risk. So even though the company might be at its optimal, you know what you should check? See if the debt they have matches up to their assets. If you're using short-term euro debt to fund long-term dollar, dollar assets, they're increasing their default risk. If you can swap out of the debt they have into better debt, debt that better suits them, what's going to happen? Their default risk is going to come down. If their default risk comes down, their cost of debt is going to come down. If their cost of debt comes down, their cost of capital will come down without even changing the debt ratio. I mean, in too many corporate finance classes, we focus so much on the debt mix lever, we forget that there are other levers for changing the cost of capital. So last question. You're noticing all these companies announcing special dividends? Just in the last month, you've had dozens of companies announce. Costco announced a $3 billion special dividend. Las Vegas Sands, $2.4 billion. There are like 60 companies that have announced special dividends. So one of the big questions is, hey, how does that affect value? Let's, let's step back and look at what a special dividend is. Let's say you're, you're looking at Apple. There's $120 billion as cash right now. 
I know that a lot of that cash is trapped. They can't bring it back. Let's assume, though, it's not, that they have access to the cash, and they're planning to pay a special dividend of $75 billion. You're a stockholder in the company. How does a special dividend affect you if you're a stockholder in a company? Tell me the mechanics of what happens in a special dividend. First, look at the company's balance sheet right now. What does it have? In the case of Apple, it has $400 billion in operating assets, $120 billion in cash, and you own all of the equity. There's no debt. Remember, the $520 billion is the market cap of the company. So that's what the company looks like right now. So what's going to happen the day after the special dividend? If I look at that balance sheet, has anything changed in the operating assets? No, they still have the iPod, the iPhone. The $120 billion in cash is going to become $45 billion in cash. Your market value of equity is going to drop by roughly $75 billion. You say, that's terrible. My stock price drops. But the day after the special dividend, you know what you're going to get? You're going to have a stock worth about, it, it used to trade at $540. It might now trade at $470. Right? The, on, the spe, on the X dividend day, it's not even close. You're going to see the stock price drop, drop by roughly the amount of the special dividend. And you're going to have cash on hand of whatever your stock price drops. So instead of having $540 in Apple stock, you're going to have $470 in Apple stock and $70 in cash. You see? So nothing happens here? Most of the time, I'd have said nothing's happened. But we're at a very, very unique time in the market. Why might you be happier with $470 in Apple stock and $70 in cash today than $540 in Apple stock? Oh, come on, you've been reading about the cliff, right? What happens, Esteban? It's not even a potential. It's a guarantee. And here's why. Your best case, I'm not kidding. The best case scenario you're going to face with capital gains and dividends is both are going to go up to 20%. In fact, effectively, both are going to go up to 23.8%. Where's the extra 3.8%? That is actually part of the health care reform that actually kicks in on January 1st. All dividends and capital gains will get taxed an extra 3.8%. So the tax rate is going to go up to 23.8%. So if I did not pay this dividend, and you sold the stock three months from now, assuming the stock price doesn't even change, I mean, because then that adds an additional layer, you'd have had to pay 23.8% of your capital gains as taxes. Instead, I've given you $70 in dividends today on which you pay only a 15% tax rate. So effectively, you're saving 8.8%. That's your best case. That's your worst case scenario. Best case scenario is, if you think in, in terms of pure taxes, is the tax rate on dividends goes up to 40%, and they actually decide to pay the dividend next year. Then you'd have paid a 43.8% or 42% tax rate on that dividend instead of 15%. So normally, special dividends do nothing for stockholders. They just replace what would have been a capital gain with a dividend. But because of the change in the tax rates right now, you could potentially see stock prices go up on a special dividend because investors say, this is good. I've saved on personal taxes because of that special dividend. And therefore, I'm going to push up the stock price. There are companies, however, who don't. In this case, it was cash paid out as a dividend, right? What if you borrowed the money to pay the special dividend? Then what would be different? What's the value of your operating assets? It's the present value of your expected free cash flow to the firm discounted back at the cost of capital, right? If I borrowed the money to pay this dividend, do you see the second effect that kicks in? Those cash flows are not going to be altered. It's the same business. But because I'm using more debt, my cost of capital could be different. Lower or higher? Don't answer, right? Because you don't know who the company is. If the company is under levered and I borrow money to pay the dividend, I get a second, a second benefit here, which is I move towards my optimal. My cost of capital goes down. My value as an operating assets is going to go up, which in effect is going to add on to whatever tax benefit I get. So your best case scenario are under levered companies going out and borrowing money and paying these big special dividends because not only do you get the tax benefit of getting the dividend now as opposed to next year, you now have those companies moving close to their optimal. And it's a different kind of tax benefit that's kicking in and increasing the value of the company. 
But if you're already correctly levered or over levered and you go out and borrow money to pay a special dividend, then you get a trade off, right? You're happy because you got that special dividend, which reduces your taxes, but you have to offset that against the fact that the no company now has become over levered, its cost of capital has gone up, which in turn could lower the value of the offer. So you, it's not, if, if any time you face scenarios like this, don't let anecdotes drive the way you think. Go back to basic balance sheets. Go back to basic valuation. The answer is always going to be there. Yes, Joe. Sure. Only if you have existing debt, right? The problem with Apple is they can pay the entire 120 billion in debt because they have no debt. I'm sorry, the entire 120 billion is a special dividend. Joe's point is a very good one. Which if, if you already have debt, paying dividends, special dividends, is going to lower your equity and your debt ratio will go up. So. Almost without trying, your debt ratio is going to go up in most companies. But if a company with no debt pays a special dividend, then the, the, the debt ratio can't go anywhere because there's no debt to begin with. Okay. So that's actually a good point. Sometimes it might be unconscious. By paying the special dividend, your debt ratio might go up. And you have to ask, is it moving towards the, my optimal, away from my optimal? Okay. Yes? That's not a regular word, but let's assume it's a regular word. Okay. It's not so much the time. Did everybody get this point? Let's assume we live in a world with no taxes. We're all in Bermuda. We all moved to Bermuda. I'm thinking about doing it. You can join me there. Okay? Everybody pays no taxes. The question that's been asked is, isn't there still an impact because you're paying tax? When I pay dividends, you have to pay taxes right now, and you have no choice. You see what I mean by no choice? You can't tell the IRS. I didn't get the dividends. I lost a check, or I misplaced the check. So they know you got the dividend. You have to pay taxes, and you have to do it right now. In contrast, if you have capital gains, not only do you get to decide when you pay taxes, because you have to pay taxes only when? When you sell. So if you don't sell, the capital gains, and it's paid in the, in the future. The Time value of money doesn't matter, but the timing, I think, does. It is nice to time your own taxes. Why is that? Because your tax rates, as an individual, vary across time. Guess when you're going to claim the capital gain? In the years where your income is low, or where you have capital losses to offset the capital gains. It's nice to have that timing option. So that's always been an argument for a buyback stock rather than pay special dividend. But that's a, that's a small benefit relative to all this other stuff that's happening right now. And I would wager that as you get closer and closer, December 16, 17, there are companies that are holding on, hoping to see what will happen. But knowing how DC works, you know when that deal, if, it, if there's a deal, will be struck, right? It will be December 31st at 11.58 PM. Okay. And if you, you, so you'll start to see companies kind of give up December 18th, 19th. So don't be surprised to see. No, but why are they doing special dividends rather than buying back stock? You have a time window here, right? You got, this has to get done. You can't just announce a dividend. You actually have to go X dividend before December 31st. So in this case, you actually have to finish the transaction before December 31st. And the problem with the buyback is it might take too much time right now. Okay? It may be, the process is more involved. It might take, so a lot of the, the focus on special dividends, we've got to get this done by December 31st to get into investors' tax returns this year. So it's an interesting process. Take a look at it. If you get a chance, take a look at the companies. And this is actually a good way to test out what we talked about today. Take a look, look at the 50 or 60 big companies that have declared special dividends. Take, take the companies that you're familiar with, like Las Vegas Sands, and ask, is this the kind of company where the benefit of special dividends is going to be really high, high, or maybe low? Because it's already highly levered. Maybe there's a trade-off effect. Because that will allow you to kind of separate the good special dividends from the bad special dividends. Any other questions? OK, so let's return to our So we talked about increasing value by increasing cash flows from existing assets, right? Be more efficient in terms of cost, pay less in taxes if you can, cut back on 
maintenance capex, reduced working capital needs, all designed to increase cash flows from existing assets. So that's stop number one. Let's go to stop number two. Maybe you can make this company grow faster. It's easy to grow a company faster, right? All you have to do is buy growth. You can go out and do acquisitions. So let's add some, some requirements for the kind of growth we'd like to add to this company. We want it to be value-creating growth, right? And what's the essence of value-creating growth? The return on capital you make on your investments has to exceed your cost of capital. So there are only two ways you can grow faster. One is you can take more projects. The other is you can do acquisitions, and anybody can do that. The second part is while you do that, you want to make sure that the return on capital you make exceeds your cost of capital. And you might, you might or might not remember, but we actually broke down return on capital into two subcomponents the margin you make on your business times the sales to capital ratio. So you think about how do I increase return on capital? You can either have higher margins on your existing sales or go for more sales in your existing stores, investments you make. Either way, you're focused in on creating good growth, not just not, not neutral growth and definitely not bad growth. Some companies, are, so remember the list of companies I offered you, Nokia, Research in Motion, Hewlett Packard, you might look down this path and say, I don't see anything here, which is good growth. In which case, what should you do? Don't force it. If there is no growth, say, OK, that didn't work for me. So with each company, what works will be different than the previous company. So you can increase cash flows from existing assets. See if you can increase or find a way to have more value creating growth. One thing I think we do badly, and this graph for some reason got cut off towards the bottom. Maybe it's better in yours. Or is it? I think we might have miss, we might be missing something here. I don't even know how to fit the, I mean, it got shrunk. Never mind, I know what's at the bottom, I'll tell you, and you're not going to be surprised. So I'm not going to be surprised. One of the mistakes I think we often make uh, in, when we talk about different ways of growth is we act like all of these different ways of growing are all equally lucrative. So I'm going to list out the ways in which companies can grow, and they range the spectrum, and show you the results of a study that McKinsey did of just one, one sector, but a fairly large sector, the consumer goods sector where they looked at 50 years of data of companies that had adopted different growth strategies and asked a very simple question. Which growth strategy historically has delivered the most bang for the buck? So basically, they looked at different ways you can grow and what the most lucrative and the least lucrative ways of growing historically have been. So I'm not suggesting this is going to be true for every company, but this is across companies. By far the most lucrative growth strategy, and the way to read this graph is, See this, this, this column? That tells you for every million dollars invested in that strategy, on average, what companies got back as value added. So let's, let's take the, the very best growth strategy historically. A company comes up with new products or new services. A million dollars invested in that strategy across all the companies that tried this created between $1.75 to $2 million in additional value. So what am I talking about here? We just used Apple as our example, right? How did it get from being a $10 billion company 13 years ago to a $500 billion company now? It's new products, the iPad, the iPhone. It's, it's a series of new products, probably unprecedented in corporate history, that came one after the other. You think, why doesn't everybody try to be an Apple? They do, right? Microsoft has. And that shows you the downside of a new product strategy. Where's the Zoom? I haven't seen it in a long time. Maybe you can get it on eBay or something. You can go product by product, and you can see that companies try this. It's a strategy if you can pull it off as incredible upside. So if a company said, give me on an unconstrained world how we should grow, my answer is always going to be the same. Can you come up with a new product or service? If you can, that has historically been the most lucrative way of growth. Right below that, expanding an existing market. So either going geographically or expanding the uses for a product. Okay, so Bayer you know, gets people to use aspirin for headaches. That's expanding an existing market, John. 
No, this is across all products. And that's actually a good point. John's question was, is this just the products that succeeded? You say, so how come it's so high? When people succeed with a new product strategy, it's a very skewed payoff. You get $30 for every dollar you invest, but the companies that don't, so it's not as if every company succeeds, but the companies that do succeed get incredible upside. Expanding an existing market, a million dollars invested, gets between 0.3 to 0.75 million. Not bad, not as good as new products. Mm, go for it. I mean, this is how Coca-Cola and, and Levi's kind of went from, uh, both companies actually became mature companies in the early 80s. And then Coca-Cola reinvented itself by kind of going geographically and expanding geographically. That gave them additional growth. That's expanding an existing market. Maintaining or growing share in a growing market. So what am I talking about? Let's take the smartphone market, right? You see these market shares coming out every three months. You know, Apple's gone from 56% to 53%. And at first sight, you say, that's terrible news. It's gone from 56 to 53%. You know why it's still okay? The market itself is growing 20% a year. Even though your market share might be stagnant or going down, you're going to be able to grow with that market. A million dollars invested creates between 0.1 and 0.5 million. And then you get to the two loser strategies. I hate to label them as such, but I should. The first is competing for share in a stable market. How do you compete for share in a stable market? What do you have to do? You have to cut prices so you can keep your market share. You might even have more revenues, but your margins go down. A million dollars invested generates between minus 0.25 million. Now you're in negative territory to 0.40 million. So you might get growth, but is this the growth you really want? And then you get to the worst strategy of all. That somehow got cut off in this graph. Must be an investment banker messing with my slides. Guess which the worst strategy historically has been. I've set you up in the last three sessions for this. What's the worst way to grow? Acquisitions. And you go over, and, and if you get, I, I'll send you the corrected graph so you get it for some reason. As I said, it's cut off in your notes as well. If you look at acquisitions, historically, it's been the worst way to grow. And we've talked about why that might be, so we don't need to explore it. You know what I use is that when a company announces it's going to grow and it tells me how it's going to grow, I look at where in this, in, in this graph their growth strategy falls. I don't want want to prejudge them, but I know that if you tell me you're going to grow through acquisitions, you've already picked a strategy that historically has been a very, very difficult strategy to pull off. So, it's, so when you think about growth, not all growth is created equal. Some growth is easier and more lucrative than others, and that's really one thing to think about. Where do I go for growth? So you can increase cash flows from existing assets. Go for higher growth, but make sure it's growth that actually creates value rather than leaves you standing in place. Third way to increase value. Maybe you can build up your competitive advantages. You know how much I love strategy, right? Actually, I don't. But it has its place. And here's where it comes into play in valuation. This is a good way to think about strategy. Strategy is all about talking about competitive advantages and barriers to entry. You know why it matters in valuation? What drives value? What you make over and above your cost of capital, and how long you can continue to do it. So you need to look at a company, the question you're asking is, what are the excess returns this company makes, and how long can it keep doing it? And we can talk about numbers here, but it's really not about the numbers at that point. The question you're asking is, what are the competitive advantages or barriers to entry in this company? So here's the third way to create value. If your company has no competitive advantages, and you can find a way to create competitive advantages, it's going to show up as higher value. If your company already has competitive advantages, make sure you defend it and try to augment it. That's going to create higher value. I'm not a strategist, but as I see it, here are the four potential competitive advantages you can have as a business. And let's take examples in each. Talked about brand name, right? When we talked about EV to sales ratio, we valued brand names. And we said the power of a brand name is you get to charge a higher price for exactly the same product. So if you have a brand name, please, please protect it at all costs, because 80% of your value comes from that brand name. Don't fall into the trap of thinking the brand name is a side issue and your product actually matters. That's a trap that Coca-Cola fell into 26 years ago. By doing what? By thinking taste actually matters. Remember that new Coke, old Coke fiasco? Taste has nothing to do with this. Admit it to yourself. In fact, that syrup 
no, whatever they have, the secret syrup thing, burn it. Nobody cares. It doesn't matter. If you have a strong brand name, hold on to it. Saying, isn't it all going to hold on by itself? If you think your brand names cannot dissipate over time, look at two companies that 30 years ago would have been ranked among the top brand name companies in the world. Eastman Kodak and Xerox. Xerox had a brand name so strong that people used to talk about Xeroxing a page rather than copying a page. And now where are they? You can have a company with a great brand name, but if you don't protect it, it can kind of disappear. Avon Products is listed as the worst managed company last year. A company that was one of the great all-time franchising companies, again, because of the way the company is managed, brand name slipped away. And to show you the, the positive side of this, we talked about Levi Strauss. Levi Strauss in the early 80s, I mean, you walked into stores, it was the cheapest brand of jeans you could pick up. There's no brand name in it. Levi's was what you bought if you did, couldn't buy those designer jeans that now for $60 with kind of patterns all over your back that you didn't want to wear. But Levi reinvented itself. It reinvented itself as a brand name and found success. Harley Davidson, another company that essentially let its brand name dissipate, kind of rebuilt it. And Apple, classic example of a company that almost killed its own brand name in the 1990s. I saw John Scully on TV last week. Actually, I was with them on CNBC and didn't want to interrupt him by saying, how could you kill Apple so soon? But I, I didn't think it was appropriate to bring that up. Eh? A brand name that essentially almost went to nothing and kind of read it. So it's, it's, there's a hopeful story, which is if you had a brand name, it's gone away. Maybe there's a way. It might be too late for Eastman Kodak. It might be too late for Xerox. But if you're Quaker Oats, start thinking about what you can do to kind of recoup that brand name. Second is legal protection. What am I talking about? Wouldn't it be nice if the government stood by your side and kept the competition out for you? But be glad what you wish for. Because sometimes in return for giving you that protection, the government takes away something very important. Let me back it up. I'm sounding abstract. Would you like, let's say you ran a business. John, you're going to run a business. Would you like to have a monopoly on, the, on your business? Sounds good, right? And what's the great thing about being a monopoly? Everybody hates you, but you know how you get back at them? You charge them more. You hate me, 50% more to you. It makes you feel a lot better about being a monopolist. So the great thing about a monopoly is you get complete pricing power, right? But let's assume that in return for giving you a monopoly, the government takes away pricing power. Does that sound outlandish? Remember the old phone companies? The old power, I mean, all the US, no, all the utilities in the US used to be monopolies. They used to be regulated monopolies, which effectively meant you were the only person who could provide phone service. Everybody hated you. You got ready to charge them 50% more to get back at them. And the regulatory guy said, no, 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 no. This year, you get a 3% increase. Who wants that? Sometimes, as a company, you might want, if, if you're operating under government protection, you might actually be worth more giving up that protection and getting back pricing power rather than staying with that protection and losing pricing power. But if you can get protection from competition and preserve pricing power, this is it. You're in heaven, right? So what are we talking about? What's the closest you get to that, at least in the US? Protection from competition, pricing power. This was the old pharmaceutical companies' pathway to billions of dollars, right? You got 17 years of protection, 18, 20. And pharmaceutical companies are actually, if you ask them what they're competitive advantage, they'll give you all kinds of things. Oh, it's R&D department, it's this, it's that. The ultimate competitive advantage you have as a pharmaceutical company is that protection from competition. And they nurture it, they defend it. I mean, there are more lawyers working at Pfizer defending their patent rights than are probably scientists working on the next drug. And they can, and there are little, little techniques, I won't even call them techniques, but approaches they use to kind of extend it. Yeah. You've heard of Lipitor, right? The, blood, the, the cholesterol drug that Pfizer has? The patent, do you know the patent expired last year, 2011? 
There's Norvax, which is a blood pressure drug, which is also a Pfizer drug, whose patent expired in 2007. You say, that's terrible, a two big drugs patent expired. They created what's called a mashup. They actually combined the two drugs. So there's not, it's, it's a drug called Caduet, which is actually a combination of the two drugs. And US patent law allows you to get a five-year extended patent on that mashup. Basically, you've taken two drugs that are both off patent, the combined drug. You can also extend your patent life if you put in something like a time-released version. So um, Ambion, which is the sleep, you know, if, you, if you want to fall asleep, but there's a version of that drug where they put in a released, so it, you can put in a smaller dose. And, and that's given. So basically, they're extending the life by five years by doing something to it. Do you feel pissed off about it? You shouldn't be. If that becomes your competitive advantage, that's exactly what you're going to do, is you're going to try to find a way to preserve that competitive advantage. So if you can get government protection against competition, please go get it. You say, well, I would always do that. Of course, I'd say zero one. You'd be surprised at how many technologies and products companies have allowed to kind of slip away because they thought at the time they developed it, it was worth nothing. So they never bothered to patent it. Let's take an example. I see a bio, I'm, sure, I'm sure I see a Mac back there. Okay. You look at your operating system, it's all based on a graphical interface, right? You see the picture, you click with the mouse. Who invented that? It wasn't Apple, right? It was Xerox in their Park Labs, the Palo Alto Research Center. In the early 70s, they invented it, or they came up with it. But nobody at the Xerox lab thought anybody would want something like this. This is what happens when geeks set policy. They probably thought, who would want something like a click and point when you can do things like delete star star A? You know, you remember the old, you know, that's so much fun to do. Everybody should have that much fun. They said, nobody would want this. We want patented. And two Steve visited the Park Lab, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. It's no secret that they created the Apple IIe interface based on the Xerox interface. And to show you that they didn't learn, they did not fully protect themselves. So about a decade later, guess what happened? Microsoft, MS-DOS, the old Dell star, 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 became the first Windows. Everybody sued everybody else. And the courts all said, if you thought it was so valuable in the first place, why the heck didn't you patent it? So we forgot. So it's amazing how sometimes big ideas can get away from you because you think at the time you developed them, nobody will want this. Okay. Switching costs. You know what the switching cost is? You want to make the cost of switching into your product as low as possible, but once people switch in, you want to make the cost of switching out as high as possible. Every time I walk by one of those cell phone providers, I'm reminded of switching costs, right? You walk into a I have AT&T. I'm the only one in my family with AT&T. Thank God I don't have T-Mobile, because then I would never be able to call my family. I'd be dead most of the time. Every time I walk by a Verizon store, I'm reminded of switching costs, because I walk into that store and ask the salesperson, can I switch from AT&T to Verizon? They say, oh, no problem. We do it in five minutes, and they can. I switch, and then they offer me this 10-page document in really small print, which I can't read. Sign it. And once I sign it, my life's gone, right? They basically have locked me in for the next 50 years into all kinds of things. Hey, who can blame them? If you did not do that as a cell phone company, you know what we'd be doing? We'd start off in the morning with AT&T. By mid-afternoon, we'd switch to Verizon. In the evening, we'd switch to T-Mobile when we didn't need it, then come back to AT&T the next day. Because it's, a, it's basically a commodity, right? And if you have a commodity, the only way you're going to be able to run a business is to create switching costs. In fact, Microsoft is, I think, the master of switching costs. Because most of you don't, I mean, none of you probably remember this. But software was actually a small company business in the mid-'80s. You'd open up one of these mag computer magazines, and people in the garages would be writing software and selling it. it was every, everybody, there was no competitive brand, no barriers to entry, so you kept switching. Microsoft had changed the rules of that game when they came up with Excel. Because right after Excel, what did they do? They came up with Word, they came up with PowerPoint, then they bundled it, they offered Office. And the switching cost there was the more they sucked you in as a business, the more difficult it was for you to switch out. Because what were you going to do? You saw a better word processing program? You had to think, do I want to switch just from Word to WordPerfect? 
or just from Excel to Lotus. They dominated the business by creating switching costs. So don't underestimate the power of switching costs. And there's a final potential advantage, is if you have a cost advantage over your competition, it costs you less to produce exactly the same product, then you can take advantage of that, right? So how do you get a cost advantage? Aramco, the Saudi Arabian oil company, which is a private company, which if it were traded would probably be one of the larger market cap companies in the world, has a cost advantage. What's a cost advantage? Well, getting oil out of the sand in Saudi Arabia costs you almost nothing. So how do they get that cost advantage? They were endowed that advantage. So don't underestimate the power of, hey, you're the company, we endow you with that power. Many government companies are endowed a cost advantage because the resources are given to them. You could earn a cost advantage, right? The Templeton funds were among the first funds to go to Asia. So this was way before anybody thought about Asia as an emerging market. The Templeton funds hired analysts in Asia who did research in Asian stocks. So when Asia started exploding as a potential place to invest in the 1990s, they had a cost advantage over every other mutual fund family. And for a while, they were able to exploit it. But here's the thing about cost advantage. They're not permanent. 15 years ago, you had two big PC manufacturers, Dell and Compaq. You know who had the cost advantage when they competed? Dell had a dramatic cost advantage. It cost them about 20% less to manufacture a PC than Compaq did, which meant that they could either charge a lower price than Compaq and drive them out of business, or charge the same price as Compaq and walk away with huge margins while Compact was barely breaking even. That's what created Dell's huge rise in market cap. Now Dell is one of those companies in trouble. You know why? Now when Dell competes, it's no longer competing against Compaq. It's competing against Lenovo. And guess who has the, the cost advantage now? The cost advantage shifted to Lenovo. In fact, we talked about companies where you might be called in as a potential CEO. Dell is a company that's in trouble. Let's say Michael Dell calls you and says, you know what, I want to preserve my wealth. You be the CEO. Dell's problem is not a cash. You can't extract more cash flow from existing assets. It's a pretty well-run company. Its potential for growth actually is kind of constricting. But here's its biggest problem. What's its competitive advantage? It's gone. And if you don't have a competitive advantage as a company, you're in big trouble. You're kind of running to stay in place. Same thing with Netflix. Netflix competed against Blockbuster. It was, it was, you might as well call that fight in the first round. It was no contest. And Blockbuster is now gone. Netflix now is competing against all these myriad ways in which you can watch movies online. You don't want to send that $8.95 every month to Netflix. Again, with companies sometimes in trouble, it's not that the company is badly managed and badly run, but it's lost its competitive advantage, and the management is not sure where to go next. So cash flows, growth rate, length of the growth period through the competitive advantages. Last place to stop, maybe you can lower your cost of capital. We talked about one way in which you can lower the cost of capital is change the mix of debt and equity, right? That's how, uh, what we tend to talk about in corporate finance. I added a second, which is if you match debt up to your assets, long-term debt to long-term assets based on currency, based on, no. So if you can match up debt, you reduce your default risk, reduce your cost of debt, reduce your cost of capital. Here are the two other ways you might be able to reduce your cost of capital. We talked about betas way back, you know, the start of the class. We said betas are determined by what business you're in. And in particular, they're determined by how discretionary the product or service you offer as a company is. So if you're like Tiffany's offering a product or service that is very discretionary, you have a much higher beta than if you're Walmart. Here's something you can try. Maybe you can make your product or service less discretionary to its customers, to your customers. You say, how the heck am I going to do that? I sell $15,000 watches. This might sound cynical, but isn't that the whole point of advertising? To convince your customers that they cannot live without your product. Every morning when I drive to work, for some reason, the Patek Philip commercial is on. Basically, it's saying you don't own a Patek Philip; it owns you, or something like that. That you really, this, your life will not be complete unless you own a. You know, it doesn't quite connect. But let's say connected one is. Oh my God! I don't have a Patek Philip. I have to go buy one. That would be great for Pat because that would make 
a very discretionary product into a non-discretionary one. So maybe this is the way to measure advertising, is to look at the effect on the betas of advertising agencies. If the beta doesn't go down, you're fired. Because I thought your job was to make my product or service less discretionary. And the other factor that drives your beta is fixed cost. The more fixed cost you have as a company, the higher your beta. So if you can make fixed costs into variable costs, you've lowered your beta, lowered your cost of equity, lowered your cost of capital, right? So think about how you can make fixed costs into variable costs. You can have more flexible wage contracts and supplier, because then you can, it could also take the form of, out, I mean, I think there are lots of pros and cons of outsourcing, but one of the things you do when you outsource is you essentially take a fixed cost and replace it with a variable cost. Rather than buying copiers and putting them all over the building, you outsource copying. As I said, it's not a complete picture because there might be other things that change, but one thing that you should change is reduce fixed costs, reduce payments. So what I'm saying is think past just the mix of debt and equity to think about different ways you can change the cost of capital. So those are the four tools you have in your hand. And when you look at a company, you're saying, which tool is going to work best with this company? So here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm actually going to take a couple of companies, and I'll leave you to take your company and, and think about it, or any other company that's in trouble and think about it, and think about what I might do to change the value of the company. Actually, I'm going to make you do this. So here's the first company, SAP, German software company. This is in May of 2005. You've just been hired as CEO of SAP. So I come in and present the numbers as they look at right now. So here's what I'd like you to focus on. Think of what you might change in this company. Right? So right now, here's what the company is doing. It's reinvesting about 57.42% of its after-tax operating income with a return on capital of about 20%. It gives it a growth rate of 11.44%. It's got a pretty, pretty strong competitive advantage. It's a 10 years of growth. Discounted back at a cost of capital of 8.68%. And the mix of debt and equity they use is about 99% equity, 1% debt, which gives them that cost of capital. So they're reinvesting about 57%. They're reinvesting pretty well. They have strong competitive advantages. And their cost of capital reflects the fact they're 99. So let's go down item by item. First place, you're going to say, are there poten is there potential for, say, for increased cash flows from existing assets? So what are some of the things you're going to look at to see if that's that potential? You're going to look at their existing operating margins relative, let's say, the industry average. If your existing operating margin is, let's say, 20%, the industry average is 35%, you might say, maybe there's something we can do here to cut costs. But let me cut you off at the pass right now. When, when, when I look at SAP's current operating margin relative to the industry, they're already much above the industry average. So if you can cut costs, be my guess, but it doesn't look like there's that much fat to cut. Second place you're going to look at is the growth rate, right? And what are the two, two numbers you're looking at? What's the reinvestment rate? What's the return on capital? If the return on capital were 3%, you should be jumping up and saying, this is easy. Because then all you need to do is what? Stop investing. Anybody could do this. this. Anybody could be the CEO of a company where all you have to do is stop investing to increase value. But here, the return on capital is already 20%. So if you say, I'll increase the return on capital, I'm going to come back and say, it's already making 20%. What the heck are you going to do in this company to earn an even higher return on capital? So maybe I'll reinvest more. Maybe. It is true that SAP has a 57% reinvestment rate, which is pretty high. But it's also true that in 2005, SAP was not reinvesting very much in Asia and emerging markets. It was very focused on the US and Western Europe. So maybe there's some room there for increasing the reinvestment rate, but not that much. What's the place where you see the most potential for you to do something? What's the cost of capital? It's right now 8.68%, right? What's the mix of debt and equity? It's 99% equity, 1% debt. 1% debt is a really low debt ratio. Maybe if it's a money-losing company or a young growth company, one per, but this company has, seems to be making money. So here's the first thing I looked at. I said, what mix of debt and equity would be the right mix for SAP? And here I drew on corporate finance. I looked at the cost of capital, a different debt ratio from 0 to 90%, looking to see where my cost of capital was minimized. And the cost of capital was actually minimized at 30% debt, where the cost of capital was 7.95%. 
Now, so if you remember the mechanics of doing this, all you do is as the debt ratio changes, you adjust the, the beta and the cost of equity, the levered beta. And as the debt ratio changes, make sure you adjust the rating and the cost of debt as well. So it's a realistic view of what the, so yeah, there's something I could do. I could make the debt ratio 30% in this company. And it's not just because it's higher, it actually comes with a lower cost of capital. So I revalued SAP with two changes. One is I said, let's assume you reinvest a little bit more. I'm not going to get over ambitious. So 57%, you reinvest a little bit more, primarily in emerging markets. That's going to push up my reinvestment rate. But I'm going to be realistic. If you reinvest in emerging markets, that's going to come with higher risk. So even well, prior to this, I didn't have very much country risk. I brought in a country risk premium into my cost of equity and capital. Second, I changed the debt rate to 70-30, based upon that table before. With those changes put in, the value that I get per share is 126 euros. If you go back and look at the original valuation I got, it was 106 euros. So by making the changes I could make, the value per share for the company is increased by about $20, which works out to about how much? 20%. Oh, that rule of thumb would have worked me. Why did I have to go through all of this? Remember the 20% control premium? In this case, it would have worked, actually. It would have been pretty close to the actual answer. But to show you that the rule doesn't always work, let's take a much easier company to fix. And this is Blockbuster, way back in time again, 2004. And Netflix is just emerging as competition. Blockbuster doesn't even seem to be aware that there's competition. It keeps opening new stores all over the place. So let's look at this company. So again, you're the, the new CEO hired at Blockbuster. And you're looking at what you might fix in the company. So here's what the numbers look like. Right now, the reinvestment rate is 26%, which means it's still opening stores. And the return on capital is 4%. Red light should go off already. You compare to that cost of capital, it looks like they're growing by taking bad investments. Right? The debt ratio is based upon about 50% equity, 50% debt, 6.17% cost of capital. So if I asked you, what would you fix in the company, rather than focus on the cost of capital, because you're not going to be able to raise the debt ratio and change the cost of capital, you're going to focus, A, on maybe extracting more cash flows from existing assets, pushing up the return on capital in existing stores, and at the minimum, stop opening new stores if they're not making money. And if you make those changes, here's what you get. If you can raise the return on capital roughly to the cost of capital and raise the income on existing stores, See the $5.13 you had before? With those changes put in, the value per share that you get is $12.5. That's an amazing increase, right? 150%. But it's happening because you're looking at a business where there's lots of bad stuff going on. That's why if you take that list of nine worst managed companies, your task for value enhancement is a lot easier than if I gave you the 10 best managed companies in the US. So there's a two values. There's what I call a status quo value, where the existing management continues to run the company. And second is what we'll loosely call an optimal value, at least optimal the way we see it, of what the value of the company would be if we were able to fix the things we'd like to fix. And that's going to be the basis for what I think of as the value of control. Because there are two things that drive the value of control. The first is the value of the firm, optimal, minus the status quo value. Those two numbers you saw for SAP and Blockbuster, you can compute for any company. And the second is, to get that change to happen, you've got to be able to change the management of the company. So the second factor that comes into play in the expected value of control is, what is the likelihood, what is the probability that you can change the management of the company? So how the heck am I going to come up with that? Well, there are some things you can look at, right? For instance, if you have takeover restrictions embedded in the company, more like, more difficult to change the management of the company. If you're voting and non-voting shares, you don't like the way News Corp is run, tough luck. You can't do much about it because you're voting shares and non-voting shares. You could look at how much access you have to capital. It's much more difficult to change management in countries where the only way you can raise capital is to go to the bank to borrow the money. You know why? Because banks essentially favor the incumbents. That's why in mainland Europe, until about 15 years ago, hostile acquisitions were almost unheard of. Because you had to go to an Italian bank to do a hostile acquisition of Telecom Italia. You know what the Italian bank would tell you? Tough. You can't borrow the money because you know, you're not right to run the company. 
What broke the stranglehold was the opening of the corporate bond market in Europe. That's how Telecom Italia was acquired, is by issuing corporate bonds. So access to capital, and for many emerging markets, until about a decade ago, there was no access to capital. Equity markets were small and relatively liquid, and there was no bond market. So if you wanted to do a hostile acquisition in an emerging market, God help you. Of course, you could try as a foreign company, but then you ran into nationalistic issues. Where you, say, oh, you can't come in and buy this company. It's an Indian company, a Brazilian company. We don't want a British company or a US company owning it. But you're going to look at access to funds. And finally, you're also going to look at the size of the company. It's easier to do a hostile acquisition or a change of management if you have a small company rather than a big company. But those are things that affect the property of control. And that, those things can all change, right? As you saw in Europe, it changed from 1998 through today. Even within a market, things can ebb and flow. Because the kinds of investors who do this tend to be activist investors. So when activist investors are out there and very active, then managers are much more scared because the probability of control is, of changing is much greater. So what you're looking at is not just what the number is now, but what might happen to make it change. And you're trying to make bets on it. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to use that, 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 that process to start thinking about what the, ex what the value of control is in a company. Okay? And I'll make the argument that the probability of control changing, of management changing, increases as a function of four factors. One is, how well has your stock done recently? Companies where the stock price has dropped and earnings have done badly are more likely to see management changes than companies where that's not true. Second, it's going to depend on the structure of the board. The more independent the board is, the smaller the board is, the more likely it is that you're going to see management changes. So this is where corporate governance meets value of control. Third is the ownership structure. If you have con compressed ownership, if you have Larry Ellison owning 23%, it's very difficult to make a change in management. If you have Mark Zuckerberg owning 57%, very difficult to make a change in ownership. And finally, it depends on the industry. What you often notice is when you see a hostile acquisition in a sector, it's followed by other hostile acquisitions. It kind of opens the door to other hostile acquisitions. So there are four places I want to use this to kind of talk about how this might help you. First, I'm going to use this as a way of revisiting what we talked about in the context of acquisitions. People talk about control premiums and say, don't pay for buzzwords. Now I'm going to give you a vehicle for estimating what that control premium should be for a company based on how it's run. Second, I want to talk about all publicly traded companies. I'm going to argue that the market price you see is neither the status quo value nor the optimal value. It's a weighted average of those two numbers, reflecting the market's expectations that things could change. Third, I'm going to use this to argue that this is the way you can best explain why premiums on voting shares over non-voting shares vary across companies. Because in many countries, you have two classes of shares in every company, and the premiums vary. And finally, if you offered me 49% of the New York Mets, I'd be a lot lower price than if you offered me 51%. You know why? Because with 51%, I run the team. With 49%, Fred Wilpond runs the team. So when I buy 49%, I've got to factor in that this is perhaps the worst-run sports franchise that's a tough one in New, in New York now. You have a lot of badly runs. Yeah. And I've got to factor that in into my valuation. So let's use this as kind of a way to try to address each of those. Let's start with hostile acquisitions. Okay? Let's take Blockbuster. We have two numbers, right? $5 and change with status quo value. $12 and, you know, whatever. What, what were the numbers there? Let me go back. $12.47 as the optimal value. Let's say the stock is trading at $9.50. So you're a potential acquirer of Blockbuster. You think you can put those changes we talked about, about raising the return on capital in existing stores, cutting back on new investments. So you're willing, the value you came up with is $12.47. So here's my first question. The stock is trading at $9.50. You've come up with $12.47. Would you be willing to pay $2.97, or would you pay $2.97 as your premium for acquiring the share? Why not, Takuto? Because I can't get any value. You're making all this nasty work, right? Cutting costs, doing all this stuff. And if you pay twelve forty seven, dollars guess what you've done? You've given away the entire good stuff to me, and you're going to be left with all the hard work. So if there is control, 
and you're the one making the changes, you want to keep at least some of that benefit for yourself. So when you look at, at, at that 297, that's not an automatic premium because you want to keep some of that 297. And if, you have, if it'll take you three or four or five years to make these changes, be realistic. The time value of money's got to factor in. You've got to take the present value of those changes. So when you do an acquisition, here's my suggestion. Or if you're, let's say you will go work for an M&A division and you, know, you fight the demons and you're willing to live in there, right? <laughs> so basically, here's the three-step process for valuing a target company. Value the target company status quo. So don't even think about the acquisition. Say, if this existing management ran the company, what would happen to the company? Then value the target company run optimally with the right debt ratio, right? That difference will already give you the value of control, right? Then value synergy as a third component, which requires you to bring in the acquiring company and value the synergy. So your value of target company status quo, value of the com target company optimally run, value of synergy. Get those three numbers, put them in your back pocket. This is not to show to the target company, because if you do that, the game is over. This is for you. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to start with that status quo value. You're going to try to fight for as large a share of that control value as you can, because you're doing the dirty work. And you're going to fight for at least half of that synergy value, because why should they walk away with all the benefits? So the key to creating value in acquisitions is to know what you're paying for and to negotiate for at least a share of that for your stockholders. So this is one device you can use to value the control, is to value the company twice. Status quo value, optimal value. The difference is the value of control. Now, as I said, you're saying, what if I don't do acquisitions? What if I become an investor, and I'm just interested in which stocks to buy? I'm going to argue that what you see as a market price for a company reflects the market's expectations that the management might be changing. Let me go back to the Blockbuster example. Remember the stock price was $9.50? Let's assume my two valuations were right, which is a, which is a big hit. But let's say the $5.13 status quo value and the $12.47 optimal value are the right values. I can actually back out a probability of control changing that's been built into the market price using those two numbers, right? In fact, if I back out that number, it looks like the market is attaching almost a 59.5% chance that management in this company, I'm, just, I'm solving to the algebra problem here. And the reason that number is interesting is I did this valuation right after Carl Icahn had just targeted the company. Now, when Carl Icahn targets a company, remember, it's n the status quo value has not changed. The optimal value has not changed. You know what changes? The likelihood that management will change just went up. In fact, if I looked at the stock price before he showed up, which was 820, there was only a 42% chance of management changing. That's what activist investors do, is when they show up, they change the probability that management will change. And when they do that, the market price also changes. So that's something to factor in, is when you think about a company and what it's trading at, what you see as the price of a company will reflect that expectation of management changing. So when you look at a value of a publicly traded company, keep in mind that the price per share is a weighted average of two values, the status quo value and the optimal value, with the likelihoods being no. Now, that's actually a way to also start thinking about voting shares and non-voting shares. What do you get in a voting share that a non-voting shareholder doesn't get? I mean, if you get the same cash flows, the only thing you get at the voting share is you get a share of the control, right? Let's take an extreme scenario. Let's suppose that you have complete control of the company. The non-voting shareholder is a bystander. Here's the way I think about the value of a non-voting share versus a voting share. If you ask me to value non-voting shares, I'm going to take the status quo value. Why? Because I have no control over the company. I'm stuck with the status quo. I'm going to divide the status quo value by the total number of shares outstanding, saying, I can't do much about this. Even if I don't like the way the company is run, this is what I get. Then if you ask me to value a voting share, I'm going to take whatever the value of the non-voting shares, which comes from the status quo value, but then I'm going to take the expected value of control, which comes from how much can I change the company and what the likelihood is, and divide it up just among the voting shareholders. So let's, let's try this as an example. Right? Until very recently, Brazil, almost every company had voting shares and non-voting shares. Voting shares were called, you know, were called common shares, and the non-voting shares were called preferred shares. So that, that's the way every Brazilian company was structured. And this was a valuation from a few years ago where I valued Embraer. 
the Brazilian aerospace company. I came up with a status quo value of 12.5 billion reais and an optimal value of 14.7 billion reais. So I have two numbers, just like I did for SAP and Blockbuster. There were 242.5 million voting shares and 477 non million non-voting shares. So here's what I did to calculate the value per voting share. I took the 12.5 billion, the status quo value, divided by the total number of shares. I'm essentially assuming that everybody stuck with the status quo value, came up with 17.38 reais per share. Then I took that 17.38 and added to that the expected value of control. I attached only a very small probability that control could change because A, it's a Brazilian company, the government is a big stockholder. So there's only a 20% chance that management can change. You take the 20% times the, ch the difference in values, 2.2 billion, divided by just the voting shares, the value per voting share that you get is $19.19. That premium reflects the expected value of control. And you know what will make the expected value of control go to zero? Two things. One is the company is already perfectly managed and perfectly run, right? What's the other? What if there's absolutely no chance that I can ever change the management of the company? So this is what you should expect to see as the premium for voting and non-voting shares. If the existing management is entrenched, you can't change them, voting shares should roughly trade at the same price as non-voting shares. Take a look at News Corp, voting and non-voting shares. The difference converges on zero. You know why? There's zero chance that you and I have of changing the way the company is run. And here's the interesting thing. In Brazil, uh, about 10 years ago, if you looked at voting and non-voting shares, the difference was close to zero. Not because every Brazilian company was perfectly managed and perfectly run, because the presumption was in Brazil that you could not change the existing management of the company. Then what changed was when, M when MBEF got acquired by Integral, Belgian Brewer. The minute that happened, here's, here, here's what happened. Across the board, you saw voting shares start to trade at a premium over non-voting shares. And here's what happened in the MBEV deal that scared people. And as an MBEV stockholder at the time of the deal, I can attest to the personal consequences. In that particular case, MBEV was paid a $2 billion premium on the merger. And the entire premium was paid to the voting shareholders of the company. I was an onboarding shareholder because that's the only one shares that they were selling us. So I was sitting there, great, we're tar a target company in an acquisition. This is supposed to be dream territory, right? And nothing happened to my stock price. And people looked and said, that's why you need voting rights. That's why voting rights matter. And across the board, you start to see the differences pop up between voting shares and non-voting shares. That, in turn, is what's created the new changes in the Brazilian market, where more companies are unifying their shares and removing these voting and non-voting share rights. Because ultimately, the only way companies will do this is they recognize there's a discount being attached when they issue non-voting shares. They're giving up money by doing this. And that's essentially the effect of the expected value of control. Any questions on voting and non-voting shares? So the fewer the number of non of voting shares relative to non-voting shares, the bigger the premium is going to be. In fact, this game is being played out in Canada now. There's a lot of companies there. There are, there are, there are like five, ten voting shares owned by the founder owner of the company and millions of non-voting shares. And what the owner does is it runs the company worse and worse and worse each year. He's saying, that's terrible. Why would you do that? Then he threatens the rest of the guys. You'll buy me out or I'll keep running this company into the ground. Basically, it's expanding the value of control. And there are companies where people have paid 10,000 times the market price to get rid of those five or 10 voting shares. Because that's exactly the consequence you're going to see when, when you see that expected value of control start to widen and the number of voting shares start to drop relative to non-voting shares. Last example, minority discounts. Let's say you value a privately owned company. Right? Come up with a value of 1.6 million for the equity of the company based on the existing management running it. And you come up with a value of two million for the same company, assuming it's optimally run. If I offer you 51% of this company, I offer you control, you're gonna be 51% of two million, because it's your company. If I offer you 49% of the same company, you're gonna be 49% of 1.6 million. Why, because you don't run the company, you're a minority stockholder in the company. That 2% makes a huge difference. 
And in private company valuation, this is called a minority discount. It's when you drop below a controlling interest in the company, you see the price you're willing to pay also start to drop off because it reflects the status quo value of the company. So that's the expected value of control. Keep that in mind. I want to complete this process by telling you that value enhancement is not new to, to investors. And every consulting firm out there, this is how they make money, right? They go to companies and say, we can tell you how to increase the value of the company. Some of, it do the, some of these consulting firms do it the old-fashioned way. They do the discounted cash flow valuations. These are the levers. They go, go through what we talked about. But there are others that feel that they have to make this look like they've invented something new and different. So here's what they do. They bottle old wine in a new bottle, and they say, look, we've got the magic bullet to value enhancement. They usually give it a fancy name, EVA, CFROI, CR, OCI, whatever it is. So this is it. Nobody's ever done this before. And essentially, they all do pretty much the same thing. They get a measure of excess returns you're making. And here's what they tell companies. You should make bigger excess returns. And companies say, really? We never knew this before. And if you can make the bigger excess returns and more capital, it's even better. Oh, this is wonderful. Here, take $50 million. And then the consulting firm says, we are the only ones who can measure your excess returns because we have a proprietary way of measuring these excess returns. So you need us every year. You can't blame the consultants for doing this because this is how you want to make, you know, you have to keep coming back. So I'm going to focus on, on, on a couple of these approaches and at least lay out what these approaches bring to the table and what they don't. So the advantage of these approaches are much simpler than traditional discount cash flow valuation because I'm telling CEOs, you don't have to do, do, do a DCF, just what's the EVA for your company? What's the CFR or what? And if you make that number go up, it's a good thing. The disadvantage is simplicity sometimes comes with a cost. And that's the cost I want to kind of emphasize. So I'll focus on two measures that became very, very popular in the 1990s. The first is called economic value added, or EVA, where you take the difference between the return on capital and the cost of capital, defined just the way we did in DCI valuation, and multiplied by the book capital invested in a company or a project. So the way to read this is we have a 15% return on capital and a 10% cost of capital. You make a 5% excess return. You billion dollars invested, 5% of a billion is 50 million. That's your EVA. CFROI is a measure based upon what uh, the, the company that created is a company called Holt Associates. They've sold it to CSFB since. And here's what they do. They take the after-tax operating income. You think adjusted for what? Adjusted leases, already all the stuff we talked about. They add back depreciation and non-cash charges to that after-tax operating income. You say, where's CapEx? Where's working capital? They, they basically just add back the depreciation. Then they divide it by the capital invested in existing projects. You know, they adjust for inflation and a few other tweaks. But what they come up with is a number that looks like the return on capital, but it's based on cash flows, and it's based on inflation-adjusted capital investment. But it's used exactly the same way. You still compare it to your cost of capital. So with each of these approaches, the argument that's made is this approach is even better than anything you've done before. It's superior. You get a better estimate of value. But here's the bottom line. All these approaches are essentially taking the same mechanics, the same DC evaluation, just slicing it differently. You should get exactly the same value for a company, whether you value it based on EVA or whether you do a traditional DC evaluation. So here's a very simple example of that. I'll take a company, in this case, a company that right now is $100 million invested. It expects to generate a 5% excess return every year in perpetuity. Let's assume this company will make $10 million in additional investments each year for the next five years. And those investments are also going to make 5% excess returns in perpetuity. Beyond the fifth year, earnings will keep growing 5% a year. But the investments they make beyond year five just make the cost of capital. So Right now, they have investments making more than the cost of capital. They're going to keep adding to those investments for the next five years, and those are going to make more than the cost of capital. Then the game ends. If I value this company based on EVA, here's what it looks like. I start with 100 million existing capital. They make 5 million each year as excess returns on this existing capital in perpetuity. So that's the extra 50 million. Then those, there's the value added from investments in year one, year two, year three, year four, and year five. There's the value for my company based on economic value added. So 170.85 million. So 
So if you were paying Stern Stewart, the company that created DVA, they said, this is a great estimate of value, much better than what you'd have got using a traditional discounted cash flow valuation. Let's see if that's true. This is not a traditional DC evaluation. Traditional DC, DC evaluation, you compute free cash flows to firm every year. Beyond the fifth year, you have a terminal value. So, and if you discount those cash flows back, you get the value of the operating assets. What was the value of the EVA approach? 170.85 million, right? If I use a traditional DC evaluation, the value that I get is exactly the same. So if you're going to use EVA or CFROI or Crocky, which is Deutsche Bank's version of it, very unfortunate choice of acronym. Okay? They have a Crocky measure of, uh, and let's not go there. I've been threatened to be sued because I, I, I've said some terrible things about Crocky. But I probably don't even have to say it. Name stands for itself. But, the, but no, no matter which approach you use, don't use it because you think you're going to get a better estimate of value. The value you're going to get is exactly the same. All these approaches offer, and this is the only good thing I can say about them, is they focus value on excess returns. Right? They say value is created by making more than your cost of capital. That's a good thing. And companies need to be reminded of that because as you saw with acquisitions and investments, companies often get focused on growth and still more growth and yet more growth rather than thinking about what drives value. So let's stop there when we uh, make sure you, you send in your, um, so you, can, you don't even have to bring packet three. There are a couple of pages that I'll incorporate into the final presentation. I will send you a closing presentation after I've got your numbers. To, that's why I need your numbers first that I have to put together after your numbers come in either late tomorrow night or early on Wednesday morning. So check your email for that before you come to class. So yeah. I'm doing Netflix for my valuation mm -hmm. and